Sunday nights at 11 p.m. Eastern here on BeyondRingside.com. Join us for the Midnight Black Mass. Myself, the Reverend Dan Wilson, brings you the dark gospel of professional wrestling. Uncensored, unedited, uncut, and not for the faint of heart. You can find out more about us at YouTube.com slash PottyHumor or subscribe at PottyHumor on iTunes and Stitcher today. Forget all you know about podcasts. We welcome you to an experience uniquely different. Please join us for our coverage of all entertainment on the fringe of society. The candles are lit. The lights are dying. It is now time to welcome our host. As he steps up to the pulpit, the sacrifice has been prepared for the midnight black mass. Ghastly greetings, groovy ghoulies, and how the hell are you? Welcome to the Midnight Black Mass, Volume 7, Episode 1. The first episode of 2017 here on the Beyond Ringside Radio Network. I am your host, the Maniacal Minister, the Occult, the Devil You Know, the Reverend Dan the Dragon Wilson. And alongside me is my co-host, my partner in crime, the Southeastern Strangler, the former one-man hair band. He's an award-winning matchmaker and so much more. Andrew Alexander, what is happening? I feel that for 2017, I got to get some sort of new nickname that has nothing to do with the wrestling business. <laughs> hmm. uh, the, the mouse of hell. The, the is cat. Always the best. <laughs> The, the, the mouse of hell. Okay, well, that that's your new name. We're sticking with it going into 2017. But we've got a very special edition of the program. We talked about switching up the format a little bit. It's been mainly free-form discussion between us about a variety of topics, including the wrestling business. Going to try to steer more on the wrestling side of things in 2017, but uh, we've got all kinds of surprises lined up for you. But tonight... I would like to introduce one of my dearest friends in this sport, our guest on the program, going into the final year of his 21-year professional career, and he's got no friends left to make. (coughs) Ladies and gentlemen, it is my pleasure to bring a guy who has been uh, king of the death matches. He's been all over the United States. He's wrestled in Mexico. He's wrestled in Canada. Uh, and he's uh, amassed a whole lot of knowledge over that time, and I feel like with him leaving, it's the end of an era, and it kind of saddens me, so I'm really excited to talk about this. The Strong Style Psycho Tank, welcome to the show one more time, brother. What's up, guys? How y'all doing? I'm glad to be on here. And it won't be the end of an era. All these shitbirds, they'll be happy as fuck that I'm gone. <laughs> <laughs> Well, then that's yeah, that's what all. I was saying. You know, it, it is the end of an era in, in that respect because um, the, the business has changed in so many ways. And you're one of those guys from that era before it sort of transitioned over. And I was kind of like the middle of that era. So, I, you know, I, I'm sad to see your knowledge and experience go. And like you said, some of the shitbirds might not be happy about what you have to say. But, uh, hell, you know, they need to hear it a lot of the time. So I, I don't have any sympathy for their feelings so brother um what do you got on the plate coming up for 2017 in your final year what are some of the things you want to accomplish well i've got uh i got some shows coming up uh, since the last empire show in august i've had like three matches just kind of just chilling out you know, we had a baby uh and and on halloween so i've just been kind of doing the whole dad thing but i've been taking some booking January, February, into March. I've got, I've got a couple of bookings into May. I'm going to do a deathmatch tournament in New Jersey in May. Uh, probably be, be my last one that I'll ever do. So um, I'll make the best of that. But I've got some shows at Southern Fried uh, Championship Wrestling in Monroe. I got uh, uh, 
PCW and Porterdale in a couple of weeks. I'm going to do a couple of shows in Chatsworth at RCW. They got a hold of me. So I say, yeah, I'll come down there and beat up some of your guys. That's fine. <laughs> you awesome. know, hell, their money spends just as good as anybody else. So. Yeah, it's I all mean, good. it's all good. We've all been there, you know. Sometimes you just want to fill the date on your schedule. You need to get that ring time, and, you know, it goes to the highest bidder. That's the way it goes. I, I do need to, to work off some ring rust. But, you know, it'll it'll be all good as long as nobody hurts my old ass. I, I'll be fine. <laughs> That's the thing about it now is me getting hurt because I'm all old and decrepit and falling apart. Hey, let me ask you for the <laughs> listeners just because uh, it cracks me up. And I think they're going to need to know because we're going to probably reference this a lot with you being on the show. For starters, where did the term shitbird come from? And the first time I ever heard the word shitbird was in a movie called Harley Davidson and the Marlboro Man. I guess I, that movie might have came out in 90, 91, somewhere around there. And I heard it. I was like, shitbird, that's awesome. Fast forward on damn near 30 years later, it just popped in my head one day, and I was like, that guy, he's a shitbird. Oh, this guy's a shitbird. So I just started calling all the shitbirds shitbirds. So uh, I want to go on a little. Yeah, I want to go on a little small rant here uh, for our listeners. I knew that's where you got it from. Uh, Harley Davidson and the Marvel Man is such a badass movie. It's one of those movies that people shit on that have seen it and they say it ruined Mickey Rourke's career and all of these things. I employ our I implore our listeners to go watch that film. You can probably get it on Amazon for about three dollars and seventeen cents. But the movie is so fucking good. I don't know why it gets a bad rap at all. Mini rant oh, over. I just it. wanted to put that over. But uh, what a exactly, movie is awesome. I love it. Oh yeah, the movie. I mean, it's so good. I, I, I it's probably in my top. It's in my top twenty at least, and it's one of these movies oh, yeah. that. Got Razzies and probably won, like, worst movie and all that shit. But I love it. I absolutely love it. Uh, what is uh, What are some characteristics of a shitbird? Characteristics of a shitbird. Guys who don't know what the hell they're doing. They get out there and they try to imitate a match move for move that they don't have the talent to do. You know what I'm saying? Like, I, I was going to bring this up, you know, last week uh, – Kenny Omega and Okada had a hell of a match. Everybody's, you know, five-star this, five-star that. I'm just wondering how long it's going to take for some shitbird to go out and try to do that exact same match, move for move. i give it a couple more weeks. I'll be sitting in a locker room and be like, God damn, they just stole that whole fucking match from Omega and Okada. Like, have there been any shows since that match happened? Because it's probably already been stolen. Probably has. I you know I, I haven't been a, been to any, but I guess I'll be in a couple, you know, here in a few weeks. And uh, I'm gonna sit and watch. You know, it was, you know, Osprey and Ricochet did their little deal, and now I get I've seen videos of other guys trying to do it, and they do it very bad. You know, if you were athletic enough to do this shit, that's fine, do it. But these motherfuckers doing cartwheels who I could probably do a better cartwheel than these motherfuckers that even try to do. <laughs> oh, that yeah, yeah, it really is a... Oh, I'm sorry, go ahead. <laughs> it, it... No, it, it really is an epidemic. Um, you, you know, guys, try to do what <laughs> you do well um, instead of copy, innovate. But that's unfortunately... Uh, the, you know, one of the biggest issues in 2016 or 2017 now in professional wrestling on the indies is uh, a lot of monkey see, monkey do, a lot less, like, let me try to be myself and find myself and see what connects with these people and draws money instead of kind of just jacking off for your own enjoyment or you're trying to pop the boys. I'm not really sure what you're trying to do by copying a match that someone else did, move for move, uh, especially if you're, like, on a, on a, you know, show that's geared more towards a smart mark audience than... Of course, they've seen the fucking match. So why the fuck would you try to copy it in front of that audience in particular? Like, it seems like instant death. Be yourself. 
don't try to copy other people. You can take a little bit from everybody that you like, uh, but but don't copy a match move for move. That's just ridiculous. Um, and speaking of that match, I want to get your opinion on something, Tank. Um, so I, I saw that Meltzer rated the Okada and Omega match, and I haven't seen it, and I've heard from many reliable sources that it was a fucking fantastic match. So I'm not trying to shit on the match. But um, Meltzer rated it six stars. Now... I kind of have an issue with that. Like, and I don't really even give a fuck about the star rating system, but you know, look, it, it, he's spinal tapping the whole goddamn thing. So if, if five is the best, then it was the five yeah, star match. Maybe it was, a, <laughs> you know, maybe it was five stars and you said, okay, but a little side note, it was like really fucking good. Like maybe even better than five stars, but that's the highest you can go. What the fuck? Damn. Yeah, they got six. Right. Yeah, Meltzer gave it six stars. I've got the damn attention span of a gnat. So if a match goes more than 10 minutes, I lose interest in it. So I actually sat and I watched the entire 46-minute match, and it was awesome. It was a great match. My my opinion, they went a little too long, and but it was no taker Shawn Michaels. For me. It was a hell of a match, and, and, and I did enjoy it. I just thought it was a little bit too long. I received a uh, text message from our... Uh... Mutual friend and mutual reject brother uh, Rufus Black today, and he said that it's arguably the greatest match of all time. That's some. That's saying I that's crazy. Know. Yeah, I mean it's you know it's different strokes to different folks. You know what I'm saying? I uh, I just it, it it was great, but it wasn't like I said. It wasn't uh, Undertaker Shawn Michaels great, or even yeah, Undertaker. And, and I, Triple H great. And I don't keep up with uh, a lot of wrestling in Japan and things such as that. But everything I've seen of Kenny Omega, like, I, I like that guy. Like, I think he's probably, he may be the best non-WWE talent out there. Uh, I mean, he's got to be top, you know, top three or so. But as far as just stuff I've seen, he seems very good, very <laughs> unique. Uh, you know, I think it's a matter of time before we see him scooped up. Even if that's a goal of his, I mean, he may not want to. He may he loves doing being the top dog in Japan, which I'm sure he's well on his way to becoming. But uh, he I mean, he's under like a, developmental. A few years ago, I mean, he he worked at Deep South where Jody Hamilton was running. He and he quit to go do Japan. So you know, he had his chance. Maybe he decided to go to Japan to get better, and then come back and try to come to the Fed or whatever. And I think he was fed in, you know, then I'm I'm reading, you know, how great the match was that Vince is like he wants to put on a WrestleMania main event that is gonna be equal to that or better. And I'm trying to think on the roster, you got AJ who to me is the, the best wrestler in the world today. Who would he work? Yeah, he would have to be in the match. Who would he work to put on a match as good as that one? You know what I'm saying? Yeah, Shawn I can't Michaels wait. Five years ago. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, 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 I want to check out this match, though, because just hearing these reports, and uh, I don't keep up with the rating system either because I've seen some matches before that got five stars, and I was like, well, that's bullshit. And then some that didn't get five stars. So, But is this the first ever six star? It is, yes. Apparently so. Well, he's, I mean, There's another like, match on the show. saying it's the best. I've watched the entire show, and there's a, my favorite match was uh, Shibata and Hiroko Goto, and just because they, they went 18 minutes, they just beating the shit out of each other. I mean, it, I'm sure it wasn't as stiff as it looked, but like I said, I enjoyed it better just because it was a, a lot shorter. Like I said, these, these long matches, they, they tend, tend to get on my damn nerves. But, you know, 46 minutes, that's a long-ass time. And I had to watch it in parts. I couldn't just sit there and watch a full 46-minute match. I'd watch it in, like, 10-minute intervals, go to the bathroom, you know, do whatever. But uh, I finally finished it after, like, two days. <laughs> it was it was good. I, I, I will say that. It was, it was a hell of a match. But it was not six stars. I don't think so, no. I mean, goddammit, five hey, stars I'm, is the highest know. we can go. 
Right, like, I, I mean, I'm sure it was fucking great, but, like, do you change the whole fucking scale for one match? Now is it a six-star scale? Now is there no, the getting a five-star match? I was like, well, fuck it, now we're going to get the six-star match, because now it's a it's a thing. Like, yeah. all's goes to 11. I mean, hell, I've been wrestling 20, I've been wrestling 21 years, and I've been lucky to have a fucking one-star match, so, you know, I don't, I don't understand the whole system. Yeah, I, I don't either, but um, I thought it was worth discussing because, you know, I, I know you're right. But the thing about pro wrestling is that there is a skeleton, a construct that it was built on, that there are certain... Uh, things and then rules that apply um, that you you sort of have to build things on. And, you know, if you're going to a certain niche or a certain type of different audience, maybe you can change some of those rules. But generally speaking, you at least need to be aware of them or where they came from. And I feel like a lot of that is lost now. What about you? Oh, yeah, exactly. This is, uh, this is actually just word for word what you just said. I mean, it's how I feel about it. Yeah, well, I, I uh, mean, you know, with he's uh he, he's he's versed in many styles. Go ahead, Andrew. I I know Dan can uh, quote on this, and Tank. It's been a long time since Tank's booked a show, but uh, try booking a show in this uh, millennial age of wrestling we're in, and you would uh <laughs> your eyes would be open to it even more. <laughs> oh dear Lord, don't get me started. <laughs> You know, if, if you're going to have any sort of impact in this business, however, uh, you know, I've learned you're just going to piss people off one way or the other. You, you know, like, hopefully you're not pissing off the wrong people and you're making the right people happy in terms of advancing your career. Uh, that That's really the only advice I could give. Because a guy like Tank, you know, he'll give his opinion on something because he's a veteran. And like I said, he was taught a way to do things and a, a not just because a why why something must be done um he'll give his advice but sometimes that doesn't make you the most popular person in the locker room does it oh no i mean i've sat in like many matches you know and then i have guys you know in the past be like you know did you watch my match i'm like sure i'll sit there and i'll watch all 15 minutes of this abortion and then they'll never even come back to me and be like hey how to what do I need to work on? And then if I approach them, they just kind of roll their eyes and walk off. I'm like, you know, so I just kind of gave up on that shit a long time ago. Because nobody, nobody wants advice. They, they say they do, but then when you give it to them, they, they really don't like it. You know, I, like I said, 21 years. And, uh, I mean, I was still, I mean, guys like Bobby Hayes and David Young, you know, guys who have been wrestling longer than me, I don't want to hear from a, you know a, a a five year guy. Oh, you need to do this. You need to do that. I mean, you need to suck my dick, motherfucker. You know, I probably. <laughs> I mean, I've had more fucking shower time. You had ring time. So shut the hell up. You know, like, but you know the whole bitterness. I was told I'm a, a, a an over bitter, loud mouth asshole. So I was like, ah, it is what it is. I mean, because there was guys like that when I started. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? I mean, there was all the guys that have been around. Your Larry Cheatham, your Richie Dyes, your uh, you know, Jim T. Joe. He didn't say a whole lot. He just beat the shit out of it. And, you know, if you screwed up, oh, Joe they, they let you know about it. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Joe hated it. Everything. It's their right as bitter, crusty old timers. They put in their time. Like people bitch about Cornette, and like as much as I hate to admit it, and I, I'd hope you never hear it, but you know, I, he might be a bit out of touch finally with the the current product. And I've always thought he was the smartest guy in the business. Period. But you know, <laughs> uh, uh, um, he's earned his right to be crusty, bitter old guy because he's put in the time and the miles, and the effort, and it's just like your grandparents, you don't fucking think, you, like, what, your grandparents don't have some solid life advice? Maybe they hate black people. But we know that's not good. You can cast that to the side and say, hey, they did live this life and have this experience, so this advice might be good advice. So, you know, that's the same reverence you should have for these veterans instead of rolling your eyes at them 
or uh, telling them that they don't have the right to bitch because you bitch every week on a play-by-play session of Monday Night Raw while you're on Twitter. So why don't they have the right to bitch? Because they actually fucking earn it. Oh, yeah. Exactly. <laughs> I mean, hell, Andrew, you, you wrestled, what, 15 years? You got 15 years in? Yeah, I got, it, it was close to that, about 13, 14. Oh, yeah, well, that's, that, that's a long-ass time. And I know you worked as many fucking shit shows as I did. Traveled many miles to to get a spot here or there. And, you know, and be, but, but you as a booker, they, you know, the guys look, looked up to you. And then I would come right behind and be like, yeah, Andy's right. And they'd be like, what the fuck you thought? You know, you don't know shit. <laughs> okay. Whatever. No, I think a lot of those guys, I, I always got the feeling that a lot of those guys didn't listen to me either. I mean, some of them, but I got that feeling that they would ask or something and kind of just had the you're out of touch thing. And I am i don't think I'm out of touch. And, like, I like a lot of different stuff, but I like I like selling and storytelling, too. Uh you know, maybe so. Maybe I'm a little behind there, but I ain't gonna change on that shit. Why should I change? They're the ones that suck, you know. Uh, but yeah, I, you know, I can speak firsthand because I met I met Hank like immediately when I got got into the wrestling business. He was around like immediately, and I I, I, I mean I just and I never kissed his ass by any means, but I was just respectful. I would say hi, I'd shake his hand, I wouldn't. I would, I'd try not to annoy the piss out of him, you know. I wouldn't just yammer on about whatever in his ear all night. And, I, you know, as a young guy, I never had a problem with him in any way, shape, or form. And I've seen young guys come along and do kind of the same thing, and then that's when they have the, the perception that, oh, he's a bitter old guy or he's a bully or whatever. And it's not the case. It's just some people are disrespectful fuck. And, you know, when when Tank, when somebody like a Tank would give me advice, I would, you know, I would soak it in. I would listen to it, and I would take something from it. Even if you get advice and you don't agree with it, you could still, like, listen, process it, think about it, make a, ra- make a rational decision, not just kind of blow it off and say whatever. You know, that's what I think a lot of the young guys do now. Um, I mean, I'm... I'm I'm guilty of it, you know. In my first couple of years, in two or three years, I do something, and somebody come tell me. I'd sit there and listen to them, but deep down, I was thinking, you know, what the fuck do you know? You know what I'm saying? I, I was that asshole too. So now I know what it's like for these younger guys to, to not want to listen to somebody. You know, some of them think, well, you, you know, you've never really done anything in the business. True, but I have wrestled in 23 states. And no two different fucking countries. That's still more than you going the farthest place you've gone is like you know three or four hours away. I mean, I've I've put the miles on, and I've learned from like different guys. Like when I was, you know, here in the south, the guys who who trained me, you know, like Rawhead Rex, Ricky Die, and then you know I moved on to uh, I did some shows and chats for us. There was a different crew. Learned from guys there, and then I mean I, I'll be honest with you, my career. I don't really call it a career, but, you know, I started in 96. Nothing really took off until I went to Cornelia, Georgia, and Wildside. And I would say that's where my career started. You know, the first five years was, like, learning stuff. And then in Cornelia is when, you know, I kind of put everything together. And Bill Barons and Steve Martin, they – they just laid down the foundation, and I just went, you know, and I guess what you say, take the ball and run with it. You know, I think a lot of these guys, yeah, that, they, they, go ahead. That's, a, that's something I was going to say. Um, you know, I grew up watching wrestling and studying wrestling and knew I wanted to be a wrestler for a long time. And I just don't know how much people do that now because when I got in the business, I could watch certain people and instantly know that guy has a fucking clue. Like, that guy is doing stuff that makes sense and that I want to learn from. Like, I didn't have to get to know him. I didn't have to listen to him rant locker room. I would watch them in the ring and say, he's clearly better than me. <laughs> like, no debate about it. You, Bobby Hayes, uh, 
you know, Jimmy Ray, when he would work out with us and stuff, Woody, all of these guys, I would watch Chuck, Rex, and be like, yeah, those guys are clearly better than me. I need to pick up stuff from them. Fucking Drew Delight was like, he was still oh, yeah. at that point. He was pretty young in the business still, like kind of, but he was leaps and bounds better than like 99% of the guys. So I was like, holy shit. You know, uh, he rode, like he rode with, with, Drew rode with, with, with Kenny Arden everywhere. If you can't learn from Kenny Arden, there's something wrong. You know, everybody knows, you know, when I, when I broke in, he was, he was kind of winding down doing the whole comedy stuff. But like, you sit in the back and talk to him about psychology and, and anything else, man. Kenny Arden knew his shit. Uh, John Arden, Frenchie. You know, these are a lot of the guys that I, you know, they had been wrestling longer. So when I started, they were around. And I learned so much from them. And I learned more from Bobby Hayes than probably anybody on how to oh, work. Oh, yeah, man. What an underrated teacher Bobby Hayes is. I, I too, between you and Bobby Hayes, learned uh, most of the important shit that I knew until I got to Wildside and met Bailey and Bill and started, you know, learning kind of the other side of the business. Yeah, when I, mean, I went like, to, I went to Wild Side, when I went to Wild Side and saw like Murder One and Rain Man and some oh Adam Jacobs, some of these guys, I was like blown away. And then I think a lot of people when they get to wrestle with someone on a different level, I think they're so they're kind of so nervous that they don't soak some of it in. But I got to wrestle Rick Michaels on a Friday Night Wild Side show. And it was probably a seven, eight-minute match. Nothing to it. I was nervous as fuck. He come up. He said, I'll go for the double shot. Rain Man will come out. You just powder. That was it. He never said another word to me, and I was scared shitless. But we got in there, and the second I locked up with him, I was like, this guy is a professional wrestler. The rest of us are playing professional wrestlers. Like, he was so <laughs> good, so smooth, like... We didn't go over shit, but he had, he gave me stuff. Like, he took a little, you know, <coughs> gave me a little heat, uh, put me over a little bit, sold for me. Like, he was so fucking good. And then, like, a couple months later, I actually wrestled Tank for the first time in a single. <coughs> Excuse me, I'm sorry. And it was, like, the same thing. Like, we locked up, and I was like, this guy's a professional wrestler. We're all playing professional wrestler. And, like, I don't see how people kind of, I don't get the sense that young guys grasp that. Like it seems like you can you can tell and you can certainly fucking feel it. You know, when I went to Wild Side, I I'd already been wrestling about five years, and then like I show up and I'm I'm teaming with this guy named White Trash. We're doing the tag team thing, and then uh, kind of broke off, started doing singles matches. And I guess like one of my first singles matches I had there was with uh, fucking David Young. You know, he was, uh, I don't know if he was a uh, Wild Side champion at the time. He was a part of the of the Big Hill stable. And he had no business giving me as much of the match as he did. You know, I, we went six, seven minutes. It was a TV match. I controlled five and a half minutes of it. I missed something. He hits me the spine buster, one, two, three. He had no business giving me that much of the match. The next TV, I worked uh, Rick Michaels. No, no, Rick, Rick was a wild side champion at the time. Same thing. Five, six minutes. We didn't call him nothing in the back except the finish. And he gave me the entire match. You know, and that, that, that's just professional of, of these guys. And, you know, and I, the guys now I would try to do that with, but they just want to go over so much shit in the back. You know, they want to call a Ring of Honor style match. And I tell them, I was like, hey, oh, okay, we'll do that, we'll do that. And then we get out there, and they're like a deer in headlights. They forget the shit. And that's when I throw them on the floor and beat the shit out of them. I said, now do you remember the fucking finish? And then we'll just go from there. But Rick and David at the time, I mean, why, why they weren't signed, I have no friggin' idea why. Cause they, were, they were so so damn good. And in the same time frame, you know, Dan knows him. I had to work uh, Terry Knott. And he was an asshole. He didn't, want, he didn't want bump for me. He didn't want to take shit for me. And, you know, I got in the back, and David's like, they ain't sure to just beat the fuck out of it. I was like, ah, I'm still new here. I don't want to do that. But, like, you know, he was 
he was established. They're trying to build me up. And he didn't want to do shit with me or for me. And I was just like, ah, what the hell ever. And he got caught on fire, you know, a few months later, after that. So we didn't see him too often. <laughs> it's in my experience, and I've, I've said this for a really long time, I mean a really fucking long time, that the guys that you hear about in wrestling that have bad attitudes or that they aren't very giving and they don't help and, and stuff like that, they're, they're the guys that aren't on that next level. All the guys that I just previously mentioned – and then going to younger guys that came up like Jeremy Bain and Slim J and Izzy and Tempers and Rockwell, I would like to think myself a little bit. Like, those guys that would go out of their way to help and give guys good matches, those guys don't have, like, attitude problems and egos and all that shit. And they should. They could absolutely – Rick Michaels could have the biggest ego ever – but he doesn't. He wants to help guys. And he's still to this day, to my knowledge, is still like that. Oh, yeah. Well, I mean, if you know you're good, if you're confident in your abilities, you don't have to, you know, fling your dick around and uh, try to remind people how important you are because your actions will speak for yourself where your words don't have to. Um, and the guys with attitude problems, like if you can't recognize your betters, like if you can't look at a guy who's clearly leaps and bounds ahead of you in the ability department and see that he is leaps and bounds ahead of you in the ability department, you really got no business being here. I think that's where the psychiatric test cutoff should end uh, because clearly you're too delusional to be a professional wrestler. Oh, yeah, exactly. You know, and I know it's kind of off subject, but, you know, getting back to Andy, you know, and the booking, I mean, there were some guys that he booked and he built up that I was thinking, this son bitch ain't got a fucking clue, and this is going to be the shit. And they, and they always turned out pretty good. And then you had some of them that I, did, that I thought at the time could, could be good. They just didn't want to listen to nobody. They wanted to be a big fish in a little pond at another show. You know, where I'm thinking, you will learn more from me in five minutes than wrestling the, the grandson's owner or the the, uh, the the grandson of the owner at a different fucking show. Like I say, you know, there's just guys, they were like, well, no, I don't, I, I don't want to be the opening match. And, man, I was opening match at Wildside for a year and a half. Hell, I did more run-ins than anything. I knew my spot, and after a few years, yeah, I was, I was in main events and doing whatever. I mean, I had to do blood and guts, but, hey, that, that's what I'm good at. And what's, <laughs> what's even funnier is these guys don't realize how badass of a spot opening match is. That's a fucking amazing spot, like, to be on the card. Yeah, it's not the main event, but it is very important. Tooth and nail, last year, last Empire show in the Empire Arena – and what technically I wish was known as the last Empire show, it was a fucking huge deal. What was the first match, Tank? <clears throat> Me and Ace Rockwell. Exactly. I'd purposely done, not because these guys, oh, these guys aren't very good. I'll put them first. No, because it was a big fucking deal, and it kicked off the show, so I purposely made the decision, Tank versus Ace Rockwell. And that's the main event fucking anywhere. Anywhere. And it was first, because first is important. But you're exactly right, the, the big fish in a small pond. That's what a lot of guys want. And, I mean, I, I guess I get it, but you don't really have – you don't really have big goals. You don't have – you don't want to go to that next level. You may say you do, but you don't. No, your, your actions don't prove it. And certainly it's not an indictment of all of the current generation of talent. Otherwise, we wouldn't have it a business. Um, the guys who – succeed by and large there's certainly exceptions to the rules because of uh things that have been popularized it seems like a lot of the old uh classier ways of doing business seem to have gone right down the toilet but um still the guys who listen the guys who apply the knowledge who want to get better who want to learn as much as they can learn and not close themselves off because it might not be hip right now 
uh, to learn this, then those guys are the guys that succeed, and the proof is in the pudding. Look at the places that are considered major promotions and the guys that are pushed there. Most of those guys have their shit together. Oh, yeah. And, I mean, and right. a lot of guys that come along, you can kind of you can kind of see something in, or I think a majority of people can. I, I, I think I can. Like, I could see, like, okay, that guy has enough to go here or enough to go to this level, and that guy doesn't have as much, but he could do something. But a lot of times it could be guys that you don't see a lot in, and you give them a chance, and they kind of surprise you, and they have – the right attitude. That's such a big important part of it is having the right attitude and wanting to listen and wanting to actually wanting to improve. It's easy to say, oh, I want to get better. But that doesn't mean you mean it. Like you have to truly want the knowledge and seek it out. Oh, yeah. There's oh, you're so many right. guys out there now. Oh, man, go ahead. I'm sorry. No, you, no, you go ahead, Tank. You're the guest, no, by just, all means. I was just going to say, there's just so many guys out there who I could see, you know, want to get better. And I'm going to give you a list of them. Uh, Anthony Henry, he's tearing it up. Chip Day, uh, Joey Lynch, uh, Odinson. I mean, this guy, he looks like a fucking superstar already. He's just, you know, he's still a little green. But give it time and he's going he's gonna to be a major player. Uh, Great attitude on that one. Oh yeah, I mean, I I got wrestling one night for uh, for Peach State, and I, he he walks in. I'm like, oh, this is a big old dude. And the, the only the only thing I had, that, I mean, the match was great, but he just wanted to move too fast. I'm like, you know, I'm the I'm the heel, you're the baby face. You know, not everything's got to be fighting spirit. You ain't got to hop up for every bump. You know, just let me let me get my heat because I was trying to work as a heel. I told Rick Michaels that it's impossible for me to be a heel anyway. He goes, I'll, I'll make you a goddamn heel. I was like, all right, whatever. And they booed the shit out of me for the match. Then I came back out for a lumberjack match. They started cheating, and then they started cheering me. So he was like, yeah, you're right. You can't be a heel. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, I mean, yeah. like, there's, just so, so, there's just so many guys that got us mentioned. And then uh, and I know uh, Gunner Miller. AW. Gunner, yeah. And he looks like a million bucks. He's just got to get that, that right break, you know. And that's the thing about it, man. This is like the, the wrestling business. is like the music business. You just got to be at the right place at the right time. And I knew after about 10, 15 years in, I was like, you know, this is as big as I, it's going to get for me. And I'm, and I'm content with it. A lot of these guys, they're not content with it. I was happy with my spot. Uh, Empire and Wildside and Anarchy and IWA Mid South and all the shows I did up north that really you know meant nothing, just paydays. I was I was I was content with those. And then uh, you know we got to do the little spot at Raw. Hell man, that that was my pinnacle right there. Just getting just like oh shit, I'm I'm at a WWE show in the back hanging out getting free catering. <laughs> Yeah, yeah it, it is really oh, that culture shock when you get that first extra spot. It's like, whoa. <laughs> you know, then I see guys that, that get extra spot who have, been, have who have like two matches. I'm like, oh, okay, just because he knew somebody. And it's just, you know, that's what brings the, the, the bitter part out, I mean, is there was guys in that area that have wrestled 15, 20 years who would probably never get a spot. Somebody had a spot because they knew somebody else. Yeah, you know, I think that's, that's kind of horse shit. But it is what it is. And I told him about it. You know, I heard his feelings. And, but it's all good. Love you, CJ. <laughs> 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 uh, he's a nice man. guy. <laughs> Say what? Nice. <laughs> nice guy. Nice guy. <laughs> <laughs> yeah i i mean I, I i agree with you you know it's funny like we we all grew up watching wrestling in the 80s and then uh becoming <laughs> like that tape trader audience that like sought out all the old territorial tapes and shit you know 
And so, like, I think we'd all probably been happy just working Memphis if that was, like, as far as we ever got. And Memphis kind of died, so there really wasn't Memphis anymore. But Wild Side, when it was super hot, was, like, it was close. I mean, it wasn't really close because we weren't putting 11,000 in the, the Mid-South Coliseum. But in terms of accomplishing that goal, we got to do the weekly TV. We got to run a little loop between Athens and Tekoa and some of the various little spot show towns that we had. So, you know, it was almost like a full-fledged, like, the last of the dying territories. Oh, yeah. I mean, I mean a who's who of anybody. Came, came through that building, you know, and, like, Scott Hensley, like, brought a poster to one of the shows from an old Wild Side show, and it said uh, uh, Moxley was on the show, Dean Ambrose. I'm like, I don't even remember that guy being there. Or uh, what, was, what was the guy from the Spirit Squad? Uh, Ken, uh, Ken, Ken Ken Phoenix was his name at Wild Side, but, yeah, it was Ken, Ken Dykstra, Ken Doan, like, whatever. Yeah, he took, like, a cab from Maryland to get there, some shit, or stole his mom's car or something. I forgot what it was. He was, like, 15 years old. I mean, there was just so many guys that have come through there that, like, I look back, I'm like, I don't even remember that guy being there. Just because there were so many good guys that came through there at one time. And Bill was – and Bill would give, pretty much give anybody a shot. Like, I always thought, man, if I could get a spot here, anybody can. And I'm the drizzling shit. You know, I could just throw a, a a cactus jack elbow from the apron to the floor, and I carried a sickle around. That's why I got a spot. But then I was down there, and I actually learned. I, I learned how. I learned how to how to work. You know, I mean, I, when I came in. Like I said, you know, Bobby taught me a lot. But when I got down there, I was I was I learned more of the the business aspect of everything. You know, if it's a TV taping, you can't just go around and shake hands and, you know, hug girls and kiss babies before your match. you got to get your ass in the ring and start the fucking match. And Bill would chew my ass out for that. Just about every TV. It's a wonder he never fired me for it. You know, I was a big baby face. <laughs> oh, thanks. I'd want to fucking soak that glory in and be like, oh, man, this is awesome. But I get in the back. God damn it. You know, play the hard cam. I'd, I'd pin somebody. I had my back to the hard cam. They'd be mad as hell. <laughs> what is what is use the ring cam? You know, it was. That's just like I think a lot of these guys need some kind of a TV taping to uh, to really learn what the business is. It's not just going out there and seeing how many fucking spots you can do on a match. Well, that's, that's ultimately that my goal. At why we wrestle is to kind of reinstate that, uh, you know, where we got the weekly TV going strong, even if it's just on the internet. It's like that's an experience that they don't get elsewhere. Exactly. I mean, like I said, I learned so much. I'm sure Andy learned so much about the 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 business part of it, and the business part of it is the TV. The matches were the easy part. It was learning other shit, you know, promos and you know, being on time, you know, knowing your cues. That's the thing now, man. You try to tell a kid to go ten minutes, or it'll be like, oh, I won't get all my shit in. I'm like, well, that's 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 part of it. Yeah. Every yeah, match now that I maybe. see on the Indies has got to be 50-50. I mean, nobody, baby faces don't know how to sell. Heels don't know how to, they don't know how to be heels because they want to out-wrestle the baby face. That's the, that's the last thing you want to do as a heel is to out-wrestle the baby face. You want to cheat, poke, poke eyes, rake eyes, you know, pull hair, get the ref's attention, do shit like that. Now it's just like, I'm the bad guy. I'm the good guy. Let's have a confrontation. Let's just go back and forth, back and forth. You know, and some of the smart marks love that shit. You know, they're 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 a part of the problem. But I won't get into that because a lot of smart marks like me, so I don't want to hurt my fan base there. <laughs> uh, that, yeah. a, a lot of the little stuff. A lot of the little stuff that's very important about like I don't know timing and wanting to do too much and wanting to treat every match like it's the biggest match of your life. I think that's something that pretty much everyone does, and that though it's not wrong to do that. There's nothing wrong with being green. Everyone is. The problem is, so many people they never grow out of it. They re- it's like, how long have you been wrestling? Eight years, and you still have that mentality as if you were wrestling six months. 
Like, that's the problem. That's when it's an issue, is when you, you make no effort to fix it. It's like, I've been wrestling eight years. How many promotions have you wrestled for? How many different towns have you wrestled in in eight years? How many matches yeah, have yeah. you had? You know, to yeah. me, years don't mean shit. It's how many matches you've had. And I've, I've had a shit ton of matches. <laughs> you know? Uh, I'll, I'll, you know, like, all over the place. And I see these guys, ever somebody had posted on Facebook the other day, he had 300 matches last year. First, I want to call bullshit on that. There's no fucking way. And if you did, all you made was $48.12. So, you know, to me, that's not impressive. Yeah, 300 matches, that would be about six a week. I, I bet there's, I bet the majority of WWE talent hasn't had 300 matches in a year, like, you know, last year. Oh, hell, they just, they wrestle twice a week. Okay, three times, they do a taping. And then two house shows, and then you know once a month the pay per view. Yeah, yeah I you may not be Europe. booked on all of them. Yeah, exactly. I'm like, so you've had six matches a weekend, because you're you know you're a, you're a, you're a weekend guy. Most promotions don't run during the week. You might find a handful here and there. I'm yeah, like, see, yeah, most guys are weekend guys now. They have to be. Yeah. It's a, it's all it's just very frustrating because you you got because man especially when you see these guys and you try to help them and it just goes in one ear and out the other it's like they think their shit don't stink so that you just can't teach them anything and I'm like man Jimmy Jimmy Ray came down and was like telling guys stuff and I I, I asked him because I couldn't be there for like his seminar and I said hey man what what kind of stuff you tell these guys and he told me and it was like word for word shit I said and I told him I was like. Well, since you're a Ring of Honor guy, and they all love Ring of Honor, I hope they listen to you, because I've said the same shit. They don't listen to me. <laughs> I'm like, who, do you, who does this information have to come from? Like, it's not shit I'm pulling out of my ass. It's not stuff that I'm making up on the fly. It's stuff that I can show my work. I can tell you this is why I'm telling you this. This is who I heard it from. And it's just like, oh, you don't know what you're talking about. <laughs> like, Okay. <clears throat> yeah, I, that's one thing I, I can say is up. we heard it from someone who was more successful than us. Yeah, exactly. That's, that's it's like, thing. oh, well, you never, you never did anything. Yeah, and I pretty much know the reasons I didn't do anything. So don't make these mistakes. Do this, this, and this. You know, people. Sometimes, sometimes you can learn what not to do, or sometimes you can learn from people's mistakes. I mean, that's I, one thing I, I will say. I, after twenty-one years. I've always been like a student, uh, a student of the game. You know, watching wrestling when I was a kid. You know, I didn't really pick up on stuff because I was I was a kid. But then when, you know, when I got older, I'd watch something, and be like, okay, they're they're doing this and this way and this way. And then when I got got into business, I was like, you know, all that stuff I was watching as a kid. You know, it's it's all right. You know, you work the left side of the body, you do this, you do that. You know, it it takes a lot to learn the whole psychology of stuff. It's not just like uh, just throw you out there and drop you on your head and you kick out at one and you get up and you give me four hurricanes into a spinning hole. <laughs> you know, they just try to do, do too much stuff. There's just, there's a, there's a lot more to it than how many cool moves you can get in a map. Yeah, nothing lot. wrong with cool moves, but put them in the right spot. Yeah. No, yeah. There's, there's, a, there's a lot of good talents out there that, that I would say do too much, that I've told directly to them, it's like, man, that's just so much, that's so much. And, but they, and a lot of times they know it, but that's kind of, that's the end thing nowadays. Like, that's a lot of stuff that people bite on. Now, don't get me wrong. I'm saying you need to know how to do that style. You need to do it correctly. You need to do it where stuff looks good, not go out there and look like an asshole for 20 minutes ripping off stuff. But, you know, these guys will say, yeah, I mean, I don't like to do that much, but that's kind of the deal, you know, because a lot of fans of independent wrestling and that style that they're accustomed to. But, man, you got to have a clue. you got to know how to do that shit. you got to know how to get the most out of it and not just do it because you saw it on TV. You know, I'm going to talk. 
I took a lot of, you know, I took a little bit, you know, I'm a brawler guy. And I took a lot from Abdul the Butcher and some from Bruiser Brody, some from Stan Hansen. And like I referred to earlier, you're not going to see me in the middle of a match try to do shit that I can't do, like cartwheels or or cool little spinny, flippy moves. And people would just be like, what the hell is he doing? I remember one of the Empire shows, I was working at Ryan Vega, and I was like, I'm going to wrestle this match. I'm not going to come out and do my shit. And we locked up, and I did like a little a little bit of technical stuff, and the crowd was dead silent. I was like, yeah, this ain't going to work. Uh, you know, they cut me off. We started fighting, then the crowd was up. And then my wife tells me, who's like my biggest critic, she's like, you need to stick with this and punching and kicking. He says, you, know, you ain't worth the shit as anything else. <laughs> <laughs> you know, she, I, I mean, I, I mean, think that's... The... Oh, go ahead. You know, that's, that's the thing. A lot of these guys, they, they'll, they'll sit in the back and they'll call a five-star match. Or they think, you know, oh, this is going to be great. <laughs> then they get out there and they perform this five-star match, move for move, and if the crowd's sitting on their hands, they don't know how to call an audible and do something different. You know, I like to go out. We can call a few things. And if the crowd wants comedy, we'll give them comedy. I mean, I did a whole match with Jason Hampton. All I did was tweak his, his nipples the whole fucking match. They didn't give a damn about me brawling. They wanted to see me play with this guy's pit. And, you know, it's just you got to fill out the crowd. I mean, if you go out and do this whole big spectacle of a match and the crowd shits on it, that's your own damn fault, you know. I tell you, I tell you what, well, I fucking think, man. I, there would be matches at Empire specifically, and I know what happens everywhere. But man, there would be badass matches in the ring. There would be matches like I knew would be the best match of the night, or that you could learn from, and it would just be amazing. A main event, or maybe not even a main event, but just the guys that like. That I am not even a wrestler anymore. I'm booking the show, and I'm watching as a fan. Like, I want to watch this match. And guys are back there fucking dicking off, talking, uh, going to concessions to get some pizza, outside smoking weed or smoking a cigarette or all this stupid shit, talking to their girlfriends. And I'm like, are you kidding me? This match, this free education is in the ring, and nobody's paying attention to it. Yeah, like any time Bobby yeah. Hayes is in the ring, I mean, I've, I've seen Bobby work for 20 years. So I'd always be like, you know, his 10 minutes is going to be better than any fucking thing else y'all are going to do tonight. And he, honestly, was kind of like me, wouldn't do shit. Just psychology, working the crowd. And then, and like Andy was saying, they'd be out dicking around, trying to hook up with a 12-year-old rat or be outside smoking weed or something. But, you know, it is what it is. They're just, they, like you said earlier, they're just guys pretending to be wrestlers. <laughs> so. Yep, and the ones that want it are going to surpass them, you know. And uh, that's the way it goes. I, I'm really not a fan of the trend of everybody watching the matches going away. Like, I don't know when the hell that happened, but it used to be religious, especially in Wildside, even in Anarchy. Like, I mean, everybody was huddled around the monitor watching every match because, A, you wanted to make sure that you didn't see some shit that you were going to do, so you didn't do it later. And then also... Uh, just to see, you know, what sort of ebb and flow of the card, not necessarily what you had to top because the card wasn't always booked like that, but, you know, where your match fit in the rhythm of the card. And you, as experienced pros, you know what I'm talking about. Uh, you know, a match like a, a start off with a hot opener and then go to a more like wrestling based match. And, you know, like there's an ebb and flow to cards that, that you can kind of predict the audience. So you want to see where you fit in on that. Nobody watches the fucking matches. Like, I mean, I don't say nobody. That's, again, not an indictment on everybody. There's a lot of guys that watch the matches, but not everybody is watching the matches, and that's a problem. I mean, that's why you have, you know, 18 super kicks a match. You know, back, I mean, I've, I've, I've been on shows where, like, you know, I did that death match show a few weeks ago, and I, you know, I always like to do the little necro spot. We sit down and punch each other. I did that spot, and then the match right after me went out and did the same shit. I was like, you're not watching what the hell I'm doing? I mean, of course, me and Chewie did it better, 
But, you know, that's beside the point. They still did it. Yeah. Don't make a lot of it sense. It is what it uh, is. Nah, I'm about to dip, dip shit. So, uh, running into the last five minutes or less here, looking at the time. Yeah, we got about four minutes left on the broadcast. But uh, I've had so much fun, and I think we've barely just got into this discussion. What do you think about coming back next week? That's cool, man. I'm all for it. All right. Maybe awesome. Well, we'll continue I, this. Maybe next week I can tell the Dump Sanders story. I forgot. I, I think so. <laughs> I think yeah, it ooh, ties into what ooh. we talked about of sometimes standing up for yourself and, uh, you know, making enemies. So I, I think there's a whole chapter to be told <laughs> about that. <laughs> oh, yeah. But, you know, hey, man, th- thanks for having me on. You know, I'm the, old, the last of a dying breed. You know, I know. Uh, and, and I love you guys to death. So we are, y'all are family. And there's, oh, there's I feel the same way. There. I consider family, you know, and you – you, you motherfuckers are family. So, hell yeah, man. Next week, let's do it all over again. I, I think that cool. sounds like a winner. So, so before we get out of here, though, we've got a, a couple of minutes left, and I think it's worth um, asking one more question. And Andrew, if you got one, you can. Hopefully, mine will be quick. Um, so, once, and I'm not trying to push you out the door by any means, but once August is come and gone. And maybe you've taken a couple of months off, and you're starting to get that itch again. Do you think you can see yourself working in the business in a different capacity? I know you've booked in the past. Um, there's certainly always a place for other great minds in the business. So, uh, just curious if you have thought about that. Oh yeah, I've thought about. I mean, I'm going to be gone, not dead. You know what I'm saying? I just, I mean, if there's some shows that need some help booking, I'm a I always consider myself a pretty good finish guy. You know, I can give guys some neat little finishes, something different. You know, like I said, if guys want to learn, I'm willing to teach them. And uh, that's, that's the gist of it. You know, the only thing about going to shows is I want to just, I obviously have to leave my bag at home. I have my wife burn all my shit because I'm sure I want to get there and want to go get in the ring or do something. You know, and I've even thought about maybe helping training. I don't think I have the patience for it. But maybe I'm getting a little bit older and and a little bit more of a pussy. Maybe I could uh, help out with some training. Uh, you know, I just want to get through these next seven months and then just go from there. You know what I'm saying? Yeah, hey, yeah I got you probably, question. you know, I'm, I'm sure. Oh, go ahead. No, I, I, I got a quick question. Uh, and I've said this to you privately. Uh so I hope you don't think I'm a total dick for calling you out for it on the air, but you know I totally I don't buy for a second that you'll stay retired. Like it's not gonna happen. <laughs> that's that's what everybody's saying. Yeah. I, mean, I, I don't yeah. know. We'll, we'll see. I'm I'm trying to tell myself, you know, August that's it, I'm done. But you know, i that's just something that, that I'm gonna have to deal with myself. Even my wife, she's like, You so full of shit. You'll, you'll, you'll take a couple months off and somebody will want to do some some show and you'll, you'll go do it. And I'm like, nah, I'm going to I'm gonna try to actually say when I'm done, I'm done. I mean, hell, you said it and hell, you've been done. I mean, you had that little one little gimmick from Vega, but, you know, I might be a good little special ref, special guest referee every, you know, a, a time or two. Hell, oh, I, I might even, even... Go ahead. I might even need to get me a hood or something and be the the Max Shipbird or some shit. <laughs> See, I think I think I'm a, you'd be great. I think you'd be great in a capacity of somehow in the in the locker room or booking or just whatever. I just don't. I just don't think you'll be able to. I mean, it's it's hard to shake something that you that's been a part of your life for 21 years. Like, oh yeah, oh if yeah. You, if you it's like, it's like if you were crack. jerking off. If you were jerking off for 21 years and then you're like, you know what? Come August, I ain't gonna jerk off no more. One night, <laughs> you gonna be rubbing that dick, and you gonna start jerking off. <laughs> yeah, that's that's true. That's true. Yeah, man. Being being in the business is like you know being fucking addicted to drugs. You know what I'm saying? It's just something that I'm gonna have to get over. I mean, I like I said, I say all this shit, and 
I'm probably going to be the biggest asshole. But, oh, I'm going to have one more match somewhere else. I hope not. And I'm, I got it in my mind that August is going to be it. So, like I said, we'll, we'll just go from there, and hopefully that's what happens. But I know if I don't stay gone, y'all are going to make fun of me. So, I'm ready for it either way. Oh, we are. I, 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 I expect it might be a Terry Funk retirement, but Terry Funk's my favorite wrestler <laughs> of all time. So you're not in bad company. Uh, oh, no. But hell of a show, man. <laughs> Thank you so much for joining us. Look forward to next week. Um, follow Tank on the social media. He's on Twitter at Tank underscore EST 1996. Is that right? <laughs> On Facebook, awesome. it's my real name, Warren Hollander. And all I do is make fun of shit birds, post pictures of my baby, and dog videos. So I'm pretty boring. <laughs> <laughs> Don't let him fool you. Add him if he's got any more spots. He's always entertaining on there. All right. Well, so, well thanks, guys. I can't wait to do it again next week. Uh, looking forward to it, brother. Sounds like a plan. Uh, Fast Eddie Lane, you got anything to plug before we say goodbye? Actually, if I could, let me go and throw this one out there for everybody listening live. Beyond ri- Ringside, damn hiccups. Beyond Ringside Back to Basics returns tomorrow night. That's going to be January the 10th, 9 p.m. Eastern, 8 p.m. Central. The To Be Determined Show, Wicked Nemesis, Angie Nemesis. The, the insanity continues this coming Wednesday at 10 p.m. Eastern, 9 Central. Keep your eyes open on Beyond Ring... Son of a bitch. BeyondRingside.com. And for me personally, it's FastEddieLane.com. Awesome. Andrew, anything you want to say to the audience before we send them home? I might do some live webcam stuff to where you can watch me jerk off for like 10 bucks an hour or something. I'm thinking about something. That's good. <laughs> nice. Can we call him Sonny Alexander? I'm sorry? Are you going to go by Sonny Alex- Alexander doing that on Skype? <laughs> sure, sure. <laughs> No, no, he's not using Skype. He's he's going for the the more um, more marginalized audience. He's going to Chatterbait. <laughs> <laughs> Roll Tide. Hey, chatter, Chatterbait's awesome. <laughs> and Tank pops back in. <laughs> I, can get, I love I can it. Get chatterbait. I can get Chatterbait on the PS4. It's, it's pretty cool. <laughs> Well, there you go. Fan fucking fantastic. (laughs) Well, for the strong style psycho tank, our producer, Fast Sandy Lane, Andrew Alexander, the Mouse of Hell, I am Day the Dragon Wilson. This has been the Midnight Black Mask. Keep one foot in the gutter and one fist in the gold. Good night.